back again. So we got the seven heads. 545, 46, 47, 48. In 548, his wife dies. So whoever the seven heads are, she's not among them. The other thing that happens in 548 is there were some setbacks. There are a lot of setbacks that occurred during this whole period. Because remember at the start of it, Justinian is in a two-front war. There's just become three fronts because of the people coming down from the north here. So he's got... He's, he's playing diplomatic and monetary games with the people of the North to hold them back. Dividing them against each other, playing nice to all. Finding out who hates who, and then paying off each one's enemy to go get the other guy. Hi, I'm your friend, but, you know, the, the Gepids are not, and so I'm being nice to you, and why don't you go get the Gepids? That was one of the names of the groups that was fighting during this time. Or else it's the, the Sclavines, or, and they have all kinds of names. It's hard to keep track. So he's, he, he's buying off and using diplomatic stuff, not troops, to, to sort of hold at bay and keep fighting amongst each other, the peoples of the north who are coming down. Those same peoples, however, will end up still coming down and nearly kill the empire right here at 558. That's why I had to introduce the whole clause in the last couple of increments. Meanwhile, however, he's also got the Persians off again, on again, on this eastern, you know, portion of his empire. And on the west, Italy was still not yet reconquered. Okay? One of the wars goes on until 562, and the other one goes on until 554. And I forget which is which, but I think it's the Italy war that ends at 554. <laughs> So that would be really more like here. Okay, and then the Persian War is off again, on again, I think, until 562. Which is, for, you know, right in the middle of Hegune. But between that, in the middle of it, where we got the calf, we're now at 548. He loses his wife. And the other thing that's happening is that Belisarius isn't having the kind of uh, good luck uh, well, it's not really a question of luck, but he's not he's not faring so well, uh, obviously, in Italy or in Persia. And it's there's a huge distance between those two places, okay? So, there, so Belisarius has been sent by Justinian all over. He's the go-to general, the guy that's at, the, at his right hand in that picture, who I pointed out at the beginning of the last segment. And he gets, he, he's overcome because his wife dies. And it's just like he goes ballistic at this point. And one of the things he does is he sacks Belisarius. So at the moment, Belisarius is not one of the seven either. I mean, he sacks him. He doesn't kill him. But he's in a state of disgrace. And that's why I think Procopius started to write at this point the secret history, the anecdota, anecdotal, or however they call it. Okay, because Bel because Procopius is really ticked off that after all this hard work by Belisarius, he ends up getting sacked for no good reason, because Justinian's jealous, actually. But you can understand, you know, imagine being the emperor at this point. You got people on your north that you have to play games with. You got people on the east. We're rattling their sabers again. You got people in the in the west who are rattling their sabers again, and the only general you got that you really depend on is not is not having a good time of it, even though it's not his fault. You got to do something, and if you're half crazy already, which he is, and we're gonna see just how much more half crazy he how crazy he is in a minute. Um. You blame somebody. So he blames his best friend and his lo most loyal ally. And that's what turns Procopius from being sort of laudatory, semi-critical, when he's writing his first book, which was about the wars. Now that Belisarius is sacked, our boy Procopius doesn't have a job either. And so he starts writing his secret history about here. 
and it's nasty because he's mad at Justinian. Why wouldn't why wouldn't he be? Okay. Well, sacking your good general for no reason except you're jealous because you know he's won so often and he has one bad thing that happens to him, so you sack him. You know, you're not going to be doing too well anywhere else. So he's 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 at his like nadir here. He's not at his the nadir of nadirs. Nadir means bottom. Fancy word for bottom. He's at the bottom of his life right here. And so he lashes out. Okay? Now the kingdom isn't doing too well. First of all, they had, you know, the plague here that they're not even really recovered from. They had had bad crops during the decade before. And that's what kind of brought the plague because what everybody needs to know is you do not want the earth to cool. Global warming is a good thing. It helps crops grow and it keeps the bugs away. And when the temperature drops like it did precipitously in the decade prior, you start getting grabbed by and having holding bad crops, wet crops, mold, insects which turn into plague. And that the bubonic plague has not died out. It's still in the world today. So it hits. And that's Constantinople where it hits. This is where it started in Africa. This is it moving up to the Middle East, and this is it hitting Middle East and Italy. And this is it hitting him. He learned nothing from that. He hardens again. He hardened here because he won. And he's hardening here because he lost. Because he's in a sort of state of loss here. Everybody's fighting now, and he's on his two front war, which has just become three fronts. And his seven advisors now become six, whether you're talking about his wife or you're talking about Belisarius. So he's at a low point in the middle. Here's the head. The head, see? Kephali. That's plural. But the head of the heads is low. So he hardens again. He hardens again. Because here is where he learned that, well, I got, if I get nasty, I win. So when something bad happens, he gets nasty. So he gets nasty again right here. And he hardens like Pharaoh here. All right, and that's 549. And you can sort of understand it here. Be empathetic because his wife died and, and he just fired his best friend. And even though he did it in a fit of pique and jealousy and all that, after you do something like that, you start to regret it if you're half human. All right. So this is 549, 550. And there's something really bad that happens at 550. I don't remember what. I know Procopius is writing during this, this time period. The, the scholars all date him to be some, writing somewhere in there. Okay, something else happens really bad at 550. I'll have to go back and look it up. 551, 552, and here's the killer. 553. This is really, really bad. Okay. Jore. Mountains. Hello, seven mountains. You've heard me talk about it ad nauseum now. Jore. At the whore. Remember? Whore. Religion, Seven Mountains First Plank in today's 2017 is religion. Yeah, and that's 553. And you know what our boy does? Remember, this was a picture. This is a picture of the unity of church and state. On your right hand, you got, on your right hand, you got your generals. Okay, and on your left hand, you got your priest. That's a picture of the, the, the state depends on him being the head of the church and him having the military force of his generals to enforce himself. You see that? Okay, he's the head. That's unity of church and state. You're looking at it right there depicted in the picture. That's Byzantine doctrine. That's third Rome in Russia right now, how they think. This Putin wants to be the next Justinian. He's aiming for it. He issued a sort of propagandic review of the Byzantine Empire where a, a, a Russian priest, see, 
he, the Russian priest narrating it isn't like head guy. But he does this, you know, little over an hour video, which you can see in YouTube. It's called The Lesson of the Byzantine Empire. I'll try to remember to put it in the comments so you can look at it yourself. It's, it's Putin's manifesto to become the next Justinian. It's real bald. Okay, and it's translated into English. And it's put out by the government because the priest that's doing the narrating is supposed to be part of the government because that's the whole Byzantine ideal of government, is a unity of church and state, which is what the seven mountains people in America behind Trump are saying. So Hore, to put Hore right here, and for us to find it now, at least I'm finding it now, and I'm finding it because Anoni Nominom found Matthew 24, 25 last year, and I've been investigating it ever since, and I'm finding so much confirmation, it's di I'm dying. Okay, 553 AD is what that is. Har. You got that, the sound. O, that's an O, and it's pronounced sort of like a flattened O, like almost like an A. R. It looks like a P in English, but it's an R. And the Russian alphabet is the same. Okay, that's 553, honey. And you know what Justinian does in 553? He says he is the head of the church, and therefore the church can't do anything without his permission. Anything. He creates a bottleneck of himself. Yeah, because he's crazy. He started to go crazy once he got the plague and he recovered. That was one of the symptoms that stays with you as a result of it if you do recover. And he goes nuts. Fires his best friend here when his wife dies. And even if he was healthy, you can imagine that he might succumb to that. But he gets worse right in here. Okay, up to 553, and he's not having good success on the battlefield either, of course. So he says, I'm the head of the church. You see why this is Antichrist? I'm the head of the church. And the church, and this is Byzantine now, including the Pope. He, everything he says, the church has to obey. Well, you can imagine how that went over with the Pope in Italy. Not very well. Of course, he's a whore of his, of his own. So now we, ha we have the war of the whores on the mountains. Who's going to be king of the mountain? And Justinian says, it's me. And he issues, I think it's called the three chapters, but you can look this up, Justinian 553. It's got different names. But he basically convenes, uh, I don't know if you call it a synod, if he's convening it, he convenes a meeting of the clerics and he says, listen, you can't do a thing apart from me. Everything you want to do, you got to get my permission to do it first. I think it's called, I think they call it the three chapters. But that's what he orders. So he's God now. You see that? He's God now. He's the head of the church. In other words, there's not only is there no separation of church and state, but he's going to tell the church everything they everything they want to do. They got to get clear it with with him first. Right here. You see how pregnant this is. Now I I got to keep stressing this because this is where history is going right now too. The whole point that John's making is hi. Here's the 490 ending. Here's the 490 ending after his death. And we're coming up on the 560 ending after his death. So this is like a voting period. See, 403, 479. He's overlapping it a little bit because here he's adjusting for the fact that he's writing seven years before the millennium was supposed to start pre-church. But because Christ died when he did, the really the millennium starts seven years early. So he has to keep adjusting to the seven. All right. But he's saying, hi, in 70 years transpire here, he's telling you this is how history runs. Okay, our 490, our own 490, ends in 2130. But 
There's also, as I showed you in episode 9, there it's 490, 490, 490, 490. So the new 490 started just the following year, right here, because of Christ from Christ's birth, and then from Christ's death, it started in 521, or five, at, you know, just after 520 started is the new one. Okay, and there's a 70-year voting period historically in between. But the qualifying periods are contiguous. Okay, well, there's another set of qualifying periods that's contiguous. That's the 1,000-year unit. And if you watch through episode 9, I'm sorry it was so exhausting, but it's 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, and that, too, is measured from Christ's birth or from his death. So it's really 1997 was when our next 1,000, our, our second 1,000 closed from his birth. But the second 1,000 closing from his death is coming up in 2030. And Putin aims to be the third Rome head. And that where that will head is sooner or later, and of course the Revelation tells us this, is that the, the polity makes war with the harlot. Well, this is Justinian's war with the harlot. I control you. You don't control me. I'm the head of the church. Everything I say is what you do. Until this point, there was something of a sort of back and forth. Remember the picture? There's an equality here. See how they're just a little bit higher, but just a little bit higher. And Byzantine doctrine says there's no church apart from the head of the church, which is a political person. Yeah, well, that's what our boy Putin aims to be. All right. So everything you're looking at here that I'm talking about Justinian way back then is happening again now. And of course, the same thing is being said to Trump by the seven, seven mountains people. They're telling Trump he's anointed by God. Go look it up. It's Lance Walnow. Just search on seven mountains, Lance Walnow or Seven Mountains Raphael Cruz, but Lance Walnow in particular actually told Trump this. Walnow maintains that Trump is the next Cyrus. Cyrus is the guy who conquered um, Babylon, okay, back in the 500s um, BC. Well, here you go. 538 BC to be precise. Okay, so Walnow's telling Trump, hi, you're the next series, you're going to save America, la di la And all the other big names in Christianity you see on TV, they're all falling in step on this. So what do you think is going to happen when you got two, we really got seven heads, and don't you notice? There's, there's the religion and, and military. Two of them are military, depicted in that picture. See, two of them are military. Three of them are church, and then this is somebody in between. Well, you can say that's Ivanka, and what, this is Trump? Well, Putin, and then he's got somebody who's behind him, and then he's got the church with him already. Now, as I talk. And then here's the military, which he's got with him. Trump, I mean, Putin is running for re-election, supposedly re-election, it's a fake election, in 2018. In Matthew 25, 11, the 2018 is, is from, is the second Lord in that verse. Yeah, Putin aims to be Lord of Byzantium via Russia, who's the third Rome. You see all this stuff tying together and converging? Near, by the 20th, the 2000th anniversary of Christ's death. We're between those two points. We're between 1997, 20th, 2000th anniversary of his birth, and the 2000th anniversary of his death is coming up. And every time a 1000 occurs, from Adam forward, at every 1000 mark in history, there's a crusade. Of course, 1000 years ago, that's exactly what was brewing at this time. And it was from Byzantium at this time. Okay, it was a guy um, who's thousandth anniversary of his death is coming up named Basil and that's what he was doing the same thing Justinian is doing and he was crusading against the the 
the Muslims and it, there had already been it was just starting to be a, a full schism split between East and West churches and Basil was trying to unite you know um, old Rome with him at the same time but trying to assert control over it just like Justinian's doing here I'm trying to tell you this is a, a uh, replay now of then whether then is the time of Basil a thousand years ago or then is back here okay it's tied to the 490s as, as Christians doing it. It's tied to the whole world as a crusade at the end of each thousand. But of course the Christians are the ones doing it. That's what that's what Matthew 24, 25 is about. And, and Ephesians 1 played it for the 490. Luke plays it for the 1000, mostly for the West. Mark 13 plays it for the Byzantine Empire. And Revelation is, is concatenating both. I haven't, you know, I'm not covering here what's going on in the West exactly, because what's going on in the West exactly still is is that the Goths are fighting with with Byzantine Empire over who controls Rome, and that's not over yet. That that ends the following year, and you can see why it would end the following year. Justinian is selling his own church in the East. I, I control you now. I'm your God. I'm the head of the church, not you. Well, Pope thinks he's the head of the church. In the West, he ain't going to like that. So you can bet that there's still a war here, but it somehow gets resolved. I don't even remember who wins. I'll have to go back and look that up and tell you. But this is where Justinian is. Where? Justinian is the head of the seven mountains. And whoever the other heads are, honey, they don't matter now, because, honey, I'm the head of the head. So the unity of church and state now is headed and unified only in him. You see why this is a prototype of the Antichrist? Could God make it more obvious? All right? And the scholars don't know anything about this. They've spent billions of dollars wasting their time on who the seven heads are, and they didn't spend five minutes counting the syllables, which in Greek in particular specializes in that. They have a whole, they have a whole literature going all the way back to Homer that depends on counting the syllables, and it never dawned on them to do that. And the Jews do that. When they recite Torah, they count their syllables in sets of six, but the Bible counts them in sets of seven. How come the Jews don't remember that? But the Bible sure does, and you can see how, and you can see how precise it is. The whore talks from the whore, the mountain. So what does God have to do in reply? Not good, and that's where we'll pick up in the next thing.